Eddie Chavez. Ruben Nava. And Jesse Romero. Jesus 911. Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. My name's Ruben Nava. My partner, Jess Romero, we are a two man car. We are 10 8. We are available for calls and we are uh, giving you some Catholic briefing today. Uh, got some good stories. Good morning, Jess. Reporting for duty, sir. Yep, John 3 16 is our call letters. And we're on a soul patrol. Ruben, every se- Monday through Friday, all we want to do, realistically, uh, the three of us, three retired cops from Los Angeles, Southern California, we want to save souls. We, we see things are so dark right now in the world. Yes. Absolutely. And even many parts in the church, there's darkness, Ruben. And all this program exists to get men reactivated back into the church to take your rightful place as a man of God, to be a sheepdog. Jesus Christ needs sheepdogs. And that's why we're on Monday through Friday because we don't need sissies in the church. Okay, we got too many of those. We need real men of God. We need sheep dogs. All right. Yeah. Hey, today we're going to tell me how you really feel. Ruben. <laughs> <laughs> this is adjusting my mic here. You know, we need sheep dogs. Yes. We need, we need warriors. We need people that are going to stand up and fight and, uh, regard, regardless of the cost, you know, to themselves to, and to, uh, to serve in the, in, in the Lord's army, you know, by, by virtue of our, our, confirmation we became soldiers for christ don't ever forget that you know i I was a sergeant for the sheriff's department and i'm a private in this in jesus army but man i want to be on the front lines i i want to be out there you know slaying the dragon and uh, and and, you know finding finding places that we could make uh, inroads with the the true faith of Jesus Christ, and that's the Catholic Church, and uh, that's right. Never be ashamed of your faith. Never uh, re- fall back and and retract and and uh, cower when somebody challenges your faith. Oh, you guys are you know the papists. You guys believe in the the, the vicar of Christ, and you know uh, we just go straight to Jesus. We don't need we don't need the church. It's full of sinners to uh, to get to heaven. I just go straight to Jesus. Don't need the saints. You know. I'll tell you what, <laughs> I go straight to Jesus too, but I also do it the way he does. You know, he, he said it. The way he taught us. That's right. He set up a body at church. Hey, Jess, hey, who, Ruben, go ahead. Yeah. Who, who's St. George? Yeah, St. George. There's, there's the facts about St. George that we know from history, and then there's the legend. <clears throat> Both are very powerful. So let's go with the facts first. I'll do the facts, then you can, you can do the legend here. Okay? Got it. So St. George, he was born to a noble Christian family of Cappadocia late in the 3rd century. He was the son of a Roman army official. His mother was from Palestine. His name, George, means worker of the land. That's what George means. <clears throat> the St. George legend contends that after his parents' deaths, when George was still a teenager, he decided to go to Nicomedia to present himself to the Roman emperor, Diocletian, to apply for a career as a soldier. Emperor Diocletian, he was an evil man. He welcomed him with open arms because he regarded St. George's father as one of his finest soldiers in the Roman legion. So by the time George reached his late 20s, St. George had had obtained the rank of tribunus or colonel or second in command. And he was stationed as an imperial guard of the emperor at Nicomedia. Well, it was in the year 302 AD when the emperor Diocletian issued the edict ordering the arrest of every Christian soldier in his army. St. George, using the courage of his faith, faced the emperor to loudly denounce the edict. And in front of his fellow soldiers, St. George proclaimed himself a Catholic Christian and declared worship only to Jesus Christ. Emperor Diocletian attempted to convert St. George by offering him gifts of land, money, and slaves, but St. George refused to accept them. Before he was executed, St. George gave his wealth to the poor and prepared to face death. He was dragged through the streets and tortured excessively, including laceration on a wheel of swords. It is said that he was resuscitated from that particular torture three times. He was beheaded at the city wall on April 23rd, 303 AD. And so as a result, April 23rd has become his feast day. 
Powerful. I want to just offer a little prayer of asking for his intercession. St. George, heroic Catholic soldier and defender of your faith, you dared to criticize a tyrannical emperor and you were subjected to horrible torture. You could have occupied a high military position, but you preferred to die for our Lord Jesus Christ. Obtain for us the great grace of heroic Christian courage that should mark soldiers of Christ. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. George, pray for us. Pray for us. Yeah, that he, he kind of reminds me of like St. Thomas More, St. John Fisher, those guys, you know, they could have had it made in the shade. He, he working for the emperor or working for the king and, and they're in those British uh, bishops uh, case. But they didn't, uh, they, they couldn't stand for, for something that was, was not correct. You know, they, right. they, they couldn't just put their faith on the back burner. And uh, you know something about this story? There's a lot of stories like this in Catholic history about a lot of soldiers. Because I've read in history that there was an actual uh, an actual wing within the Roman Legion that were just Catholic soldiers. And according to history, they were like the best fighters of the Roman Legion. But they were all followers of Christ. And little by little, as some of the emperors started becoming more wicked, they started trying to disband that battalion of Catholic soldiers that were faithful to the emperor, but they just didn't want them to believe in Christ. So little by little, you, for example, there's an old classic movie. You've probably seen it. It's called The Robe. Remember that one? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's one. Uh, the story of St. Longinus. It's another one. That's the, that's the centurion that pierced Christ in the side. That's another famous story of a, of a soldier who converted. A recent one came out about three years ago on, on the movies, three or four years. Remember the movie called Risen? Yeah. Uh, okay, Risen. I mean, there's a whole, a whole uh, a, a panoply of, of Roman soldiers historically who defected because they were asked to do things that were just irreconcilable with their Catholic faith, and St. George is one of them here. Mm. Well, let's go to the legend now. Okay. Okay, so the legend of St. George, he was a knight and born in Cappadocia. Um, he came to the province of Libya to a city which he said, Silene, and by this city was a... It was stagnate uh, or a pond like a sea that which a dragon in, envenomed the country and on a time the people were assembled for to slay him and when they uh, saw him they fled and when he came when the dragon came out uh, he venomed the people with his breath and therefore the people of the city gave him every day two sheep for it to feed on because he should do ho- no harm to the people and when the sheep failed it was taken a man and a sheep. So they fed the man and the sheep to this dragon. Then was an ordinance made in the town that there should be taken the children and young people of them of the town by a lot. And and each one, as it fell, were he gentle or poor, should he be delivered when the lot fell on him or her. So it happened that um, it, came at, it became a time that the king's daughter, it was her turn to be uh Back given up Christ. right Amen. it was his turn and he, and he was beseeching the people hey you know please you know, have mercy i mean they, they they basically told him hey you made the rule up so you got to <laughs> <laughs> you got time to feed your daughter to the to the dragon so he asked for a stay of execution like the, the 8 days they gave him it um they 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 also they also said that if he didn't carry out the the his duty that they would burn his house down so uh, the day he he went there to to offer up his daughter, and uh, he that's when Saint George was passing by, and uh, he saw this damsel in distress, so to speak, and uh, he he basically said that he would take care of it. And this uh, this dragon came out. He sl- he slew the dragon with his sword, and um, and and they dragged the the dragon through the town, and uh, and he but he gave. He gave glory to God, and then in the name of Jesus Christ, he slayed that dragon. So it's not of his own doing. It was he invoked the, the, Jesus Christ, and uh, as a servant of Jesus Christ, he was able to. It's just like David, King David, when he slew the, uh, you know, the young David when he slew Goliath. It's similar to that. He slew this big dragon that was uh, terrorizing the whole country. So then he says there were 15,000 men baptized. When they saw this, 15,000 men were baptized without women and children. And the king did do make a church for uh, in the honor of Our Lady and St. George. And um, 
it was a fountain of living water. A lot of people were coming that were sick, were drinking from it, and they were being healed. And uh, the king offered St. George some money, a lot of money. He refused it and commanded that it should be given to the poor for God's sake. And he and enjoined the king four things. That is, that he should have charge of the churches, and that he should honor the priests and hear their service diligently, and that he should have pity on the poor. And after he kissed the king and departed, so he gave the king his due, his honor, and and he. But he told him, "This is how. These are the things that you need to do." And uh, so the king's daughter was spared, and and Saint George, uh, he wa- walked away a hero, but he didn't look for any uh, accolades himself. You know, it was true humility. Reuben, I'll tell you why I believe this story. Okay, because there's a lot of things in history that have been lost. In other words, the documents. But we know things through sacred tradition. And this is how every culture and civilization has passed on their traditions. Everybody, Africans, Irish, there there are just some things that are not written down. They are called sacred traditions or oral traditions. In fact, that's part of Catholic teaching as well. St. Paul tells us in Scripture. So this story is repeated so often in Catholicism. There's statues of St. George slaying a dragon. There's churches dedicated to St. George. I believe just because we cannot find the documentation of this particular St. George slaying a dragon, I believe this story is true based on the oral tradition, which is just uh, resounding. It's just loud. I agree with you, Jess. Listen to Jesus 911. Stay tuned. We've got some uh, some good stories coming up. And uh, on the other side of the break, be right back. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org. Buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow! That's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we are back. Remember, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. That's my motto. And, hey, Ruben, uh, you got my wife Anita repeating that to me now. <laughs> she goes around the house saying that. She goes, that is so true, what Ruben says. And, and of course, she means by that, 
you know, if you live in a state of grace, you don't have to get in a state of grace. So she goes, I, so, so you got her repeating oh. uh, you, you, all over the house here. I thought she, I thought she was going to say, yeah, if you keep the house clean, then when guests come up unexpectedly, they're ready. <laughs> uh, hey, Ruben, this, uh, this is near and dear to our hearts. Something that's happening in California, which right, it's brutal for our fellow officers. And I know you got a mouthful to say about this. Yeah. But it's- hey, Jessica, before we say that, can I give a, a plug? Out of course. To, uh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm going to be speaking um, tomorrow in um, in uh, Irvine. Actually, it's Anaheim. It's at the Bruheim Beer Makers. It's, I've been asked to do a talk at, at the Theology on Tap. And my the title is going to be Rise Up Catholic. So it's hosted by Theology on Tap, Orange County, a couple of parishes out there. I know... Um, a lot of people are expected to be there. So if you're in the area, uh, the address is 1931 East Right Circle, Anaheim. It's uh, tomorrow at 6.30 to 8.30. And uh, so uh, I, I call it, I, I see it as an honor when, when some people are telling me, oh, yeah, you're like little Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> you're like buff Jesse. <laughs> That's my TO. That's my training officer. <laughs> Ruben, you know what I'm going to tell up? Uh, we got to tell uh, the VMP the, the after the show. I, I, get, I just been forgetting to do it. I got to put a link in there for you and Eddie because um, you guys need to get out there. You guys need to pound the pavement. So if you guys want to get these guys to go out and speak at your parish, Eddie and, and, and Ruben, uh, this is the type of, of presentations you need to hear from two Catholic men that love the Lord and know their faith. So we'll be, we, we'll be putting a link on VMP so you can get a hold of these guys and invite them to your parish, invite them to your event. I just want to give a shout out to the men's conference in providence rhode island i was there last over the weekend a uh, wonderful group of men that invited me just want to give a shout out to you guys probably got a, another another additional hundred new listeners that are listening right now as a result of that and uh also this weekend i'm going to be in fresno at the men of men of god luncheon at uh it's going to be at the fresno at the garden fresno airport i'll be there from uh i think it's 11 a.m to 5 p.m so hey. hope to see you guys you Fresno men this weekend. All right, last Thursday. Topic. Yeah, last Thursday. I'll give a shout out to the the guys from the Saint Augustine group uh, from the parish of Saint Peter and Paul in Alta Loma. Uh, they invited me to come and speak at their prayer meeting. It was a a faith filled night with the rosary and uh, good food, and uh, I gave a a short talk. and uh, And uh, a lot of them are going to start t- listening t- to the program. I know they're. Praise God. A lot of them are already listening to it, but uh, this is this is good good news. We're spreading uh, sp- we're spreading the good news that the our Lord and Savior has put us out in the vineyard. Jess, we're His branches. Right. So, Ruben, something terrible is happening in California. California Assembly Bill three ninety two. Yeah. Which I believe puts it puts policemen in California. Uh, there's an an impossible standard that they're trying to erect. And to me, it's as if police work is not already difficult enough. Now, California liberals, they're giving us this California Assembly Bill 392, known as the California Act to Save Lives. Uh, it's uh, it, it's passed a crucial hearing vote, and it's set to be voted on within the state of California legislature. So the bill updates the current reasonable deadly force standard, which I believe it comes that comes from the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, th- that standard reasonable deadly force or th- the current reasonable deadly force standard to necessary deadly force, which would make it easier to file criminal charges against officers who use lethal force. If other enforcement options are available, according to the Sacramento B, the bill prevents unnecessary deaths by clarifying law enforcement's obligations and the bill's main author, Assemblywoman Shirley Weber, Democrat San Diego, mm, said we'll that the legislation would push officers to rely on de-escalation techniques, which, by the way, they've been doing it for decades. We've been trained in de-escalating situations, so this is not, not anything new. So Shirley Weber, that knows nothing about law enforcement, the Democrat from San Diego, says that this bill would uh, legislate officers to rely on de-escalation techniques like verbal persuasion and crisis intervention methods, which we already do, instead of lethal force, which would better protect the lives of black and brown. Ah, here it is, identity politics, Ruben, Mm -hmm. which would better protect the lives of black and brown Californians who are disproportionately shot and killed by police. That's a lie. A book came out on police shootings, and I'll I'll look it up uh, during the break. I'll get the author and the name of the book. But she, she destroys this whole myth about 
the fact that, uh, oh, minorities get shot at a higher proportion. That's just a lie. Okay. Uh, I, I will tell you why there are a lot of police calls for police service in minority areas. I'll tell you why. I'll be honest. Because there's more violent crimes committed there. Pretty simple. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. You got more, you got more broken families, more divorced families, more single parent homes, m- more daddies that have abandoned mom in black and brown neighborhoods. That's why there's a higher rate of police service there in these neighborhoods. It's pretty simple. You start destroying the family, you're going to start getting an escalation of crime. Ruben? That's right, Jess. And they're, they're using this, uh, this is one case in Sacramento, the Stephen Clark case. Um, it made a lot of headlines. The police uh, shot this uh, young man, and he was, um, he was breaking into cars and... and uh, he took. He, they had a police helicopter up. A couple, you know, a couple of uh, patrol guys uh, arrived, and uh, they found in the backyard. He had actually he jumped over some fences. Unbeknownst to them, he was jumping into his grandmother's backyard. But he came at them with. It turns out to be a cell phone. He po- he, he pointed it at them, and in the dark and with their adrenaline running, um, you know, they thought it was a gun. And and shame on him for for doing that. To, to threaten the officers with, you know, bringing a cell phone to a gunfight, basically, and and uh, they shot. And they, the, I guess they were upset that they, the officer shot 20 times. Well, when shooting's over, if, if, if you've never been in a shooting, you don't know how, you know, you get this, this tunnel vision and you get the the adrenaline is, is going so fast that, uh, I mean, Normally, when we go to the range, Jess, we're wearing ear ear heads, uh, head pieces, you know, or ear ear muffs to save our ears. But when you're in a shooting, you don't even hear it like that. And uh, I'll tell you what: afterwards, your ears are ringing, but during it, your body protects you. So he went down, and uh, you know, the Black Lives Matter came out. They found out, hey, these each officers they have a video out. They they a couple of days after the shooting, the department released the video. And you see for your own eyes that it, this was nothing malicious. They, um, you, you see the officers moving forward. They moving towards cover. If they thought he didn't have a gun, why would they move towards cover? And also, uh, you could hear the tension in their voices. And you could, one guy after the shooting says, "I think I fired five rounds." The other guy says, "I, I think I fired five or six rounds." And uh, it just, it just so happened they fired twenty, which to to the lay person, you know the the non-sworn person they're thinking wow that, that's overkill you know and uh just i've been in a shooting and i'll tell you it's uh it's it's no fun we we don't go out there to to to, to kill people we go out there Nobody to does. stop the threat jess and uh I, I i'll tell you quick a little bit about the shooting that i was in because there was a lot of shots fired and uh it was a gang member we we're in a manhunt of a really dangerous uh, gang member who was wanted for a couple of shootings. He was suspected of a murder as well on the freeway, as well as uh, possession of various weapons. Uh, we had information this night that uh, he was high on meth. He had an, he was armed with a 9 millimeter handgun, and he had told his buddy, who was our informant, uh, we sent him in there, that he, would, uh, he wasn't going to be taken alive. So all that goes to our state of mind, you know? So our plan was to lock the house down and call in our SWAT team because he had gotten away from us on a couple of different containments the last couple of days. And each time he tossed the gun, he always was armed and he was out on bail for possession of a gun and a rifle. So when we show up, uh, well, we had eyes on the house. We had a surveillance team on the house. A buddy of his shows up and he gets in the car and they drive away. So our plans were changed. We had to do effect in the traffic stop, but we had arrow, we had canine, we had, uh, a, a sm- uh, another agency with us because we were working on a, a joint cases and he didn't want to stop. He was telling his buddies, go, go. His buddy didn't want, didn't want to anything to do with this. So he's who pulled over, but this, uh, the, the crook was gunning the gas. He reached over with his foot and was gas, giving the car gas. The tires were spinning and it was a lot of tension in the air. We got out of our car and just then he starts coming out with a handgun right at his ears, pushing the door open with his end. You know, I, I yelled gun and on the round started flying. Now there was eight of us. And so there were, an, uh, there was a number of rounds. Uh, I fired seven times and, and 
when at the end of the day, there was about 82 shots fired. Now, the other agency, the two guys shot the most, but I'll tell you what, he, he was struck a number of times. He didn't die. Um, but, uh, you know, we got him out. He, he had his day in court where well, he ended up suing us for excessive force. And there was a, a civil rights attorney, a very popular civil rights attorney that you see on TV. He sued us. And, uh, sure enough, we had our day in court. We were defendants in federal court and, uh, the jury got to hear me testify and all the facts of the case, what I knew, the state of mind I was in, all the, uh, th- all the stuff leading up to it. And, uh, they said, that's reasonable. And they, th- they, they said not guilty. And we, we walked out of court and they thanked us for our service. And, uh, I'll tell you, um, it was interesting because when I was working in the, when I became a sergeant, I went to the jails. And by that time, this same individual had gotten to Min Central Jail. And I happened to be walking by the cells and he, he says, saw you. I saw him, you know, this was before. <laughs> yeah. And he starts yelling down the, the tear. Hey, this is one of the guys that shot me. <laughs> and so I had to talk with him for 45 minutes. And when are you going to be able to talk to somebody you were in a shooting with? And I, I, I spoke with him for 45 minutes about this. And I said, you were coming, you were going to shoot us. You were coming out with a gun. No, no, I, I was, I just wanted to run. And anyway, but it, he, it was kind of a lot of incriminating statements that he made that day. So we use that against him. <laughs> Ruben, but you know what? You said the key word. The, the, the court said, or the, the jury said, what you guys did was reasonable. That's, right. That's the U.S. Supreme Court standard that police, when they use force, it has to be reasonable. Okay. Uh, what a reasonable, ordinary, prudent person would do in the same situation. That's pretty much it. And going to the Catholic faith, remember, let's not forget that the church says that we have a right to defend ourselves, whether you're a citizen, especially a police officer, that's in 2263 to 2265. It clearly states that Catholics have the right to defend themselves and even use that proportionate force necessary, even up to deadly force if you have to. And this is all based on Romans chapter 13. God has ordained a certain crop of people called the military and law enforcement, God has ordained a certain crop of people uh, this authority to uh, to enact justice upon the evildoer. And so, uh, yeah, this California law, this guy's all these guys are all wet. They don't know what the Bible says, and they don't know Catholic teaching on the doctrine of self defense. Hey, let's pick up. Let's finish this when we get back. Uh, stay sure. tuned. There's more to this article, and uh, we'll be right back. Don't change that dial. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show. And they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911 on Virgin Most Powerful Radio. Two-man car, we are 10-8, and uh, giving you some Catholic briefing. We're talking about uh, uh, an impossible standard for our law enforcement officers in California. Um, we are talking about uh, they want to change the rule of law from reasonable standard to necessary uh, use of force. They think it's going to save lives, and they think that um, <laughs> they think that it's going to stop uh, blacks and browns from from being shot by police. Um, you know, Jess, you did mention it that yeah, actually more in terms of numbers, more whites are being shot, but. Um, the blacks have a, a higher percentage in terms they only make up 13% of the the population so the, they the, commit 49% of the violent uh, street crime though yeah that's right that's so, a fact yeah so it's facts, like when they told us hey facts are a stubborn thing ruben when you're stopping you you you're stopping a lot of hispanics so you're, you're st- stopping only hispanics in east la well you bring me some other people i'll stop them you know yeah, there's bring me some russians yeah so, but you know, the guy that they're, they're touting as the, the, the one behind this thing, this, this guy we talked about, Stefan Clark, they failed to, to look at the fact that the toxicology report that he had, he was, uh, he had at least 0.08. So he was legally drunk, uh, in alcohol. He had cocaine, which is a stimulant. He had cannabis, which is marijuana. He had codeine, which is a pain med. It's usually taken in a drink like a cough syrup, but it, it can be abused by, they crush these little pills and they put it into some grape soda and they call it purple drink. Uh, that's real popular with the kids these days and uh, especially in the black neighborhoods. And, uh, and it's, it's a typically abused by more blacks than Hispanics and Alprazolam, which is Xanax. It's, it's a psych med used to uh, treat anxiety and panic disorders and it causes impaired concentration, slurred speech, memory problems. All these things were in his system. So, that's why he's not listening to orders and you know they take away people's uh they they don't want people to be responsible for their own actions you know why what about that 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 has to play into it you know if he just put his hands up and stopped there would have been no shooting i i, I mean they they act like his the that the cops are out there looking to to shoot people and i'll tell you and the investigation, they, they're making some recommendations that are coming out of it that are equally disturbing. They want to prohibit chokeholds in all instances. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you're in a knockdown, drag out fight, you got to just do what you got to do to stay alive. You know, uh, if he if he disables you, uh, you know, and knocks you out, then your gun can be taken and you can be killed. Ruben, and, and actually in law enforcement, they teach us uh, to go for the carotid arteries. It's right. Not, they don't teach us to go for the trachea. And not the bar arm, yeah. Right, not the bar arm. It's, it's the, the carotid artery, which doesn't affect the you know, the vocal cords or the trachea at all, right? And also, they want to ban shooting from moving vehicles. Well, what happens if somebody's shooting? For you? That's the only recourse you have. And then uh, the other thing is emphasizing a guardian as opposed to a warrior mindset. A guardian. Oh, let's just take care of them. Well, unfortunately, police work is dangerous. It's it's ugly, just like in the military, you know. And I like that line from Jack Nicholson in the, A Few Good Men. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. Because it's those warriors that are going to keep the average citizen safe that don't want to or not willing to go and do what these warriors are willing to do and strap on boots, a gun belt, a bulletproof vest, and get out there on the front lines. And that's the problem is that, you know, police work is, sometimes it's ugly, it's not pretty to see. Uh, uh, so, anyway, just yeah. it, it's yeah. very upsetting. And I'll tell you, a lot of people are going to be leaving, I tell you. Uh, well, if this passes in California, you're going to see a lot of good young cops 
They're going to bail to the other 49 states. They're going to go to other states that that adhere to the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, their, the standard that they've put on law enforcement that you can use force or deadly force when it's reasonable. If, if California is the only state that eradicates the reasonable force standard for necessary force, you're going to see a mass exodus of probably young cops going to other agencies around the country. I mean, some of the veterans that already have too much time, they're going to stick it out. But that's dangerous, Ruben, and that's that, that to me that's a dog whistle to criminals saying, you know what? Uh we we've passed a law here or legislatively in California where cops can't do nothing to you guys. You guys could run amok because uh you know, if they do anything, they're open for a lawsuit because we've raised the bar for them. They can only use force when it's necessary. In, in Sacramento, that's the same place where they're paying gang members to not do drive-by shooties. How how ridiculous is that? You're you're gonna pay somebody to, for doing for not doing something they're not supposed to be doing in the first place. Unbelievable, Jess. Anyway, we have a caller, so let's talk. Let's take John. He's on hold. John, you with us? Hello. Here I am. I I I, I guess that uh, there's no better people to ask than you guys. <laughs> what drives this? Um, these laws, because I hear them all all the time, and I'm from California. Is it false compassion? I mean, can you guys put your finger on it? Just what is it? Yep, that's a- that. That's part of it, John. False compassion. Uh, a, I th- I think there's a lot of guilt on people's part, and I don't say white guilt. I'll tell you the guilt that we have in this country. There's two types of people. I mean, uh, it, there, there's there's uh, in in a court of law, it the courts are colorblind, but the only thing that we do see is green. The courts do see green. It doesn't matter if you're a minority. If you have a lot of money like O.J. Simpson or Jesse, Jesse Smollett, it doesn't matter what color you are, okay? Uh, green is kind of the color that gets you out of a jam in, in, in our country, unfortunately. But I tell, I'll tell you why I think all this is, uh, is, is playing out. The liberal politicians have an anti-law enforcement ideology. They do not like law enforcement. They see law enforcement... Is as one of the last bastions of conservatism, and so there's a there's a built-in animus by the left because you'll see all these laws are being promoted by leftist Democrat politicians. They do not like law enforcement, and they also want to pander to minorities. They want to pander to. They say, "Look, at, we're doing something for you guys." You know, uh, yeah, we're killing your babies, but hey, you know, we're protecting you from the police as well. So there's also a bit of pandering, uh, especially during an election year. And I, I would add, John, that um, there's a good quote from St. Augustine. He says, charity is no substitute for justice withheld. And it, with this simple statement, we can understand most of the dysfunction in the world. And it's arising from modernism it's, and its variant philosophies. And the Catholic Church defines justice as the moral virtue that consists in the constant and firm will to give their due to God and neighbor. And charity is the theological virtue by which we love God above all things for his own sake and love our neighbor as ourselves for love of God. But giving what is due does not equal loving God and neighbor. So these guys, you know, they're, they're, they think they're, it's, it might be these liberals, their their own guilty consciences. They, they, they do so much for, they try to do so much for, let's say the, the less, uh, the, the impoverished or, or in this case, the gang members and thinking that, uh, they're doing a good deed, but they're not doing it in the name of Jesus. They're not doing it in the name of God. So it's not apostolic action. And also a lot of these liberals, they have you'll find that they have advanced degrees in sociology, PhDs in sociology, and they're very impressed with, uh, with their much learning. But R- Romans one twenty two, St. Paul reminds people that are very impressed with their learning. He says this, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. In other words, because these godless politicians, they're so impressed with their advanced degrees, but they deny God, what they do is their whole view of life is horizontal, okay? Their whole view of life is man-centered. That's called socialism. And they want to build this utopia on earth. And one of the ways you build a utopia on, on earth is you, sh- is you shackle, you handcuff law enforcement. Because once again, law enforcement and military are one of the last bastions of conservatism left in this country. That's right. 
All right, John, thank you for the call. Thanks, John. Uh, we got another yeah, caller. Thanks for that. Okay. Thanks for that answer. Thank you very much. You got it, John. Thanks All right, we got another caller, Jesus, calling from somewhere in California. Jesus, you're on. Go. Hey, what's up, Jesse? Hey, I just want to say, man, I kind of agree with that law. Okay. Why? Because I used to, you know, I used to, like, think that, you know, I, I used to really respect cops a lot, but it's the younger cops that are the ones that, you know, are quick to pull that hand, that gun out and, you know, mm. do all that kind of harm. You know what I mean? I really think that, you know, I had a situation with a couple of deputies uh, back in January and I was told to put my hands up. I had nothing on me. I, I complied with orders and everything. And they still, they still came at me with force, even tried to break my arm. And ever since that day, I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not against every cop, but there is some younger cops that I think are trying to build their rep up. And they even lied on the discovery, but that's a whole different story. And I just think that, you know what, if you listen to the cops, if they say put your hands up, you know, don't put them on the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. And if they ask you to reach for your license, you know, I'm going to reach for my license, or would you like to get it, and you'll be fine. But a lot of, a lot of cops are paranoid because they got that PSD disorder where they, you know what I mean? They're, they're seeing a lot PTSD. of, a lot of things, you know? Yeah, they have that. I believe they really do have that. Some of them do. And a lot of young cops, you know, they, I don't know, man. I just think that they're juiced up and they just want to, you know what I mean? Build their, 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 their rap sheet up. What do you think about that? Hey, Jesus, you know, and, and you're free, you're, you're free to believe that. Um, and just like in every profession, even in your profession, there are bad apples. Okay. But, uh, that's they're few and far between. Less than uh, less less than one tenth of one percent of cops nationwide tarnish the badge, a and that's actually it's a better record than the clergy when if you look at the the numbers. And so uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I've just even met cops. I've even prayed with cops. Well, good. See, so you've seen the good side of them. Yeah, okay. I, I but, know and, there's good. Depth yeah, so you don't you don't want to paint the depth. the profession with a broad brush, but um, but also you know if you follow instructions and, and even if you disagree with them, That's all you gotta do. Yeah, then you, you're not gonna get hurt. You're just gonna say, look, okay, if you have a grievance with them, you do it after it's all settled. You can go to their watch commander and you can report them. But uh, you they start questioning them. Yeah, to make a decision on you though. Do they have 17 seconds to make a decision on you? They're going to uh, arrest you or not? I, well, I don't know what you mean by that. You have to elaborate. We'll pick it up on the other side. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back. This is Terry Barber inviting you, all the men, to a men's conference June 15th at the Sacred Heart Chapel. This is going to be a day where we're going to talk about true masculinity. You know, there's a problem in the Catholic Church today. We have very few men who love the Catholic faith. And I know a lot of the wives that I'm listening to right now are saying, I want my husband to be on fire for the faith. Send him to the men's conference. Your son, send him to the men's conference by going to virginmostpowerfulradio.org or call 877-526-2151. That's June 15th. When your husband comes back from this conference or your son, they're going to have a different view about their Catholic faith because they're going to meet three men who love Jesus and his bride, the church, and are going to instill in them a love for Christ and his church, the Eucharist, Our Lady. Bring them to virginmostpowerfulradio.org. Sign up there or call 877-526-2151. Full sheen ahead. It is only because of your continued prayers and generous donations that Virgin Most Powerful Radio can broadcast live each weekday. We count on your spiritual and financial support because you understand the urgent need for Catholic programming that shares the gospel with clarity and charity, but without compromise. Please prayerfully consider becoming a monthly donor. You can set it up with the touch of a button on our website, catholicrc.org.
buying or selling your home or your business property? This is Terry Barber. Real Estate for Life underwrites The Terry and Jesse Show, and they can connect you to one of 900 pro-life real estate agents around the world. And when they receive their referral fee, they will give 80% of it to a pro-life organization. Wow, that's 80%. Realestateforlife.org, 877-LIFE-US-1. Now, back to Jesus 911. If this call is not an emergency, dial 888-526-2151. Jesus 911, we're back. We uh, we just we're on the phone with uh, with Jesus. Looks like he's not with us anymore. But uh, you know, he's free to to disagree um with Ruben, I only got one comment to make, mm. okay? What's that? And I'm glad Jesus called in. I'm glad, he, I'm glad he's a listener. Yeah, exactly. I'll just tell you this, that uh, objectively speaking, I would say that law enforcement officers in the U.S. Are the, are the best trained officers in the world. I say that because half of my family lives in Mexico. My family mm. has told me and continues to tell me horror stories, my parents, about law enforcement in Mexico. You have no civil rights over there. There is no... Civil Rights Commission, ACLU, Internal Affairs. In Mexico, my family says, if you cross the police wrong, and many of them are working for the cartels, by the way, uh, that it's very common for them to take you to the desert and execute you. That's common in Mexico. Or they will beat you mercilessly and throw you in jail. And there's none of this, you know, 72 hours of arraignment, you go before a judge, you know. Uh, The jails in terrible, uh, uh, the, the, the jails in Mexico are horrible. Uh, my family members have told me that people are chained to their beds wow. for days and weeks. You urinate and you defecate right there where you're chained to your bed. So I'm just saying, I think we're spoiled as Americans. Uh, you know, we expect perfection. We live in a fallen world. I'll tell you one thing. I'd rather be arrested by a cop in the U.S. any single day than a cop from Mexico. And I also have friends from Cuba have told me the same thing. In Cuba... If you look at a cop wrong, you'll be arrested, taken to the desert, put on your knees, and shot behind the head. So once again, uh, when it comes to complaining about law enforcement, guess what, Ruben? I'll take the law enforcement in the U.S. any day of the year compared to any of the banana republics we have south of the border. Yeah, and I think uh, our caller was was stating that it's these younger guys. And he may have a a point there because, you know, it's just like— we talk about the millennials coming up and there, there is a different, um, a mindset with the, the millennials there. Um, uh, it, it, more of them are into it's, it's about me, myself and I, and, um, again, I'm, I'm not, not trying to paint them all with the same brush, but that has happened. And that does happen. And as our engineer pointed out, look, what's happening in schools, you know, the, what they're teaching them in schools. So people, are are less faith based. They they're not uh, practicing their faith. So, yeah. So you could get some people when they're not they're not uh, believing in God and they're not uh, following their faith. It's it's real easy for someone to step out of line, I guess. And uh, and that kind of goes to our next article, Jess. Ruben, let me just mention one thing. We go before we go to our next article. I blog today on my website, jesseromero dot com. I answered the question. If you, people ask, if you're in the military and you're Catholic and you have to take a life, is that considered a mortal sin? So if you want to see the answer based on scripture, based on the catechism, go to my blog today, jesseromero.com. And uh, you'll see that there's a thing known in the catechism of the Catholic Church as justifiable or excusable homicide. Go ahead, Ruben. This, uh, th- this article was near and dear to my heart, Jess. Uh, how the Catholic faith strengthens police on the beat. I know we got a lot of first responders listening to this show, so listen up because uh, we're going to try to give you this in a nutshell here. It's um, it talks about uh, it's it says it's politically correct to criticize institutions that do not follow the left's agenda, or the media are sympathetic to so-called oppressed people and movements. They have a deep antipathy for the police forces to re- restrain violence and disorder. Thus, that's what I just said the last segment. Yeah, that's right. Thus, violent crime against the police is happening everywhere. However, the increase in anti-police violence in the United States has been higher than in most other countries. 
So the FBI reports that 50,212 police in uniform were attacked in 2015, and 28% were injured. Two uh, other sources reported that 48,315 police were attacked in 2014. In 2017, death rates for active police increased by 20%. We got, we got a target on our back, Jess. Recent reports relate that seven police were killed in the first three weeks of 2019 alone. Most of those fatal attacks on officers involve cars who run over the police officers as they stand beside their car. One case involved a fatal shot to the head. And we talked about the one officer up in um, up north. You know, She was shot just handling a call, right. a traffic accident. And uh, in this atmosphere of violence, many police officers are naturally concerned about the security. The, the chief of police of Bartson, Kentucky, stated that he's always armed, even when he goes shopping or mows the lawn. Sounds like me. When he showers at home, he makes sure the first to lock all the doors. Um, so how a Catholic officer should act. So with so much tension out there, police officers find great solace in religion and have no scruples expressing their faith in public. Amen. That's good. A good police officer goes on duty with both spiritual and material weapons. We've talked about, you know, wearing the brown scapular, wearing uh, your sac- sacramentals. For example, Sharif Saeed, a Catholic police officer from Milwaukee, always pins the St. Michael medal on his uniform. On the reverse side uh, is an image of St. Jude Thaddeus, patron of hopeless and possible causes. I did that too. And Jess, p- take, up, take it from there. Yeah, according to the National Catholic Register, uh, Sharif Saeed, this Catholic police officer, he credits his faith with keeping him going. He says that he deals, uh, he certainly deals with all sorts of rough situations, including domestic violence, drug abuse, gang activity, and other crimes. And he says that a lot of what we are doing as policemen and law enforcement are the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. And that's true. Whether it's giving counsel to those in broken homes, comforting those afflicted by crime, or giving the dead a dignified burial. So, uh, frequent confession and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, Ter- uh, Ruben, myself, and Eddie, we would just uh, pr- promote that to every Catholic out there that's in law enforcement. There's another story of Captain Rhett Brotherton. He's, from the, he's in the Oklahoma Police Homicide Unit. He knows that his agents, that they need the spiritual strength and consolation of the Catholic Church's sacraments and supports. So Captain Rhett Brotherton said that Officers who practice their faith and rely on the church's help in general make better officers with better judgment. They also have more compassion and overall better family lives. So living the faith gives them strength against temptations to become cynical and nihilism that can seep into their personal lives and relationships or alienate them from their children. And uh, Captain Brotherton speaks about his own experience. He says, Quote, I found that frequent confession and adoration are anchoring points for me so that I don't become the evil in which I'm immersed. And he, he also said, I definitely don't want to be in a state of mortal sin. Boy, it looks like he yeah, could be in our show. That's uh, right. Uh, you know, he could, he could sit along with us on the hot seat. Let's get a hold of him. Yeah. Uh, and naturally, Catholic police officers receive great support from their chaplains, which explains the high demand for chaplains in the police. A recent Catholic news agency story, it features Charlie Carroll, a formal policeman who worked for 10 years with the NYPD, and he said that in his career, he saw a lot of crime that is hard to imagine, but he also has seen much good. He also tried to help the homeless, whether on and off duty, and being a Catholic, he says, I just treat them as Jesus would do, he said, and that's what got me through my career. Ruben? Yeah. Well, here's my take on it. If someone's going to going to take a risk at shooting an armed policeman, then it stands the reason that nobody is safe. Um, what is going to stop that same crook from shooting an unarmed civilian? You know, think Nothing. about it, right? Um, the officer down Memorial page founder, Chris Cosgriff said that when a police officer is killed, it's not an agency that loses an officer. It's an entire nation that loses an officer. Some things that I did just when I, uh, was working in East LA, uh, I, I was I was driving back from UCLA. I was taking classes during the, the morning. I had some time to kill before my shift started. I would stop by a church right there by the station. It's called Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe, and I would pray ah, my rosary. Well. And I found out that that's the, the church that my parents were, were married at many, many years before. So I felt a little, I, it was a nice little old church, and it, yeah. uh, it was beautiful. Old Spanish style. Old style, yeah. So I would also go to Calvary Cemetery across the street, and I would walk around and read the headstones of the priests and religious 
section and pray for their souls. Um, they also have an outside stations of the cross, which included a life-size replica of the crucifixion scene, station 12. It was quite remarkable. And I would sit there and, and you know, of course we, you know, you, there's indulgences that are attached to praying for the dead and, 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 and doing the uh, stations of the cross, uh, you know, where a walk, you're having to walk it. Um, and, but I couldn't have done my job, as these officers are saying, I couldn't have done my job the way I did it without my Catholic faith. And my faith allowed me to feel compassion, empathy for those that were less fortunate. Uh, it helped me not to harbor hatred, uh, which is, would be easy to do towards the, the savages that preyed on the weak. I learned uh, to allow my humanity to be seen by those I served even, you know, even the gang members that I would de- develop cases on. I would pray, I would pay my respects just at, uh, at their gang funerals or in the neighborhood, uh, their car washes, they were, they were raising money to bury their homeboy and I would give to their donation, you know, and they would see that. Um, and I would send them my condolences and, you know, if their family was there, I would you know, pay my respects and give them condolences. And you know what, on more than one occasion, and this was really cool to see, after our department uh, or even an outside agency lost a police officer, I would get flagged down or someone would tell, uh, they would tell me, hey, I'm sorry for your loss. Sometimes they would leave a message on my voicemail on my, you know, when I was a detective in the gang unit, and they would, they would say how sorry they were when one of our comrades was, was killed. And then the other, I've told the story before, when my buddy Jesse, uh, I mean, sorry, Jerry Ortiz was, was killed and executed in Hawaiian Gardens, an inmate told me how sorry he was for my loss. And I believed it was the Lord speaking through him just to let me know how much he loved me. And uh, so, you know, it was paid back. What I gave back to these to these people in the community, um, even though we didn't see eye to eye, um, you know, just like the other caller, we didn't see eye to eye on this topic, but we didn't let that stop us from from uh, being humane and, and uh, doing giving charity to one another. So uh, it's it's really important to have that faith, especially in uniform, guys. So hang in there. That's right. You know what? It's very important for all first responders, to, especially if you're Catholic, Catholics, to practice your faith, get involved in some type of group, some type of men's group. Yes. Stay plugged in. It's very, very important. And that way, again, you don't become cynical and you don't fall into, you don't fall into a depression. You don't just concentrate on all the negativity. Be around people of faith. And yep. the last thing that I would say is this, that you know what? Uh, I, 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 I thank God for all the first responders out there because uh, just imagine one weekend without a cop in the street. Let's just say in L.A. County. Okay, there's no cops in L.A. County just for an entire weekend. Imagine the war zone that would turn into. Yeah. That's right, Jess. I agree. Uh, God bless them. Keep them all safe. And... Um, Hey, Michael, please protect him, our uh, patron saint of law enforcement. So you listen, you've been listening to Jesus 911. We hope uh, we stimulated you with some, some good topics. And um, you know, keep the faith. Stay true to the uh, the sacraments and to our Lord and Savior. Stay tuned for, for um, Jerry Mishuda on Hands-On Apologetics from the Spiritual Dojo. St. Faustina's Prayer for Priests O my Jesus, I beg thee on behalf of the whole Church, grant it love and the light of thy Spirit, and give power to the words of priests, so that hardened hearts might be brought to repentance and return to thee, O Lord. Lord, give us holy priests. Thou thyself maintain them in holiness. O divine and great High Priest, May the power of thy mercy accompany them everywhere and protect them from the devil's traps and snares, which are continually being set for the souls of priests. May the power of thy mercy, O Lord, shatter and bring to naught all that might tarnish the sanctity of priests. For thou canst do all things. Amen. Virgin Most Powerful, pray for us.